We're going to get started. Thanks to everybody for making yourselves available for our teaching strategies for online ESL tutoring uh, webinar. This is the second webinar in our series, and the last one went really well, so we hope you enjoy tonight's session. Um, first, a little bit about who we are. My name is Chris Jagazia, and I also have as a panelist tonight James Haywood, and we are the founders of a site called Off to Class. Off to Class is a tool for people running their own ESL lessons. Um, we primarily focus on one on one teaching, but we have a mix of teachers that use us online and a mix of teachers that use our content for in person teaching. And here are our email addresses. I'll share them again at the end. And of course, if you have any questions with what we discussed tonight in the webinar, you can always get back to us at our personal email addresses. So what are we gonna chat about tonight? First, we're gonna go over the different pieces of technology you need to um, get going as an online teacher. Then we're gonna make special uh, note of which video conferencing systems we like to use. Um, it's not a coincidence that we're on Zoom tonight. The software that we're using tonight to host our video conferencing system is also the system that we like to use to run our online lessons. So think of tonight as a little tour. Um, we'll, we'll get into more of that a bit later. And then we'll make special note of what you can teach online, uh, lesson content and homework, and where to find it. And then we'll, we'll jump into a live demo. So we'll, we'll show you some of the techniques that we use to teach, and you can think of yourselves as students in tonight's lesson, and you'll be seeing what a student typically sees. And then we'll open up some time for QA at the end. Like I said, you can use the QA function, um, and any questions that we don't answer live, we will, we will take up at the, end of the, at the end of the session. And of course, you can email us if you forget to ask something during, during the session. You can give us an email uh, after the session. So yes, the QA function should be one of the settings at the bottom. Or uh, some people pointed out, uh, depending on what version you're using, that you could also find the button at the button on the top of your screen. So, what do you need to teach online? Quite surprisingly, you actually don't need a lot to teach online. It's much better, and we've always been proponents that it's much better to master a couple pieces of technology rather than fill yourself up with different apps and, and different systems. So the most important thing for teaching online is your choice in video conferencing system. This is where you're going to be, this piece of technology effectively is, the, is it's your live classroom and it's the interface between you and your students and it has a surprisingly large effect on the quality of your lesson. So by video conferencing systems, we all know Skype, we all know Google Hangouts, uh, GoToMeeting, WizIQ. And Zoom, which is the video conferencing system that we're on right now. I'm going to talk more about Zoom and compare it to Skype next. Then you need lesson content. So you need, you need to be teaching something. You have such a large screen and 95% of your students' focus is going to be on their screen. So you have to make sure that you're populating the screen with exciting and, and, and fun content. And then, most importantly, you need to be able to accept payments. So for most people, um, for most people starting off in the online world, PayPal is, is, is what they'll default to. Um, it's great because your students probably already use it, and um, it's easy to use, and, there's, and anybody can set it up, anybody can start using it. Um, all you need is an email address and a bank account. You don't need to integrate it into your website. You can start accepting payments privately with your students. So why do we like Zoom so much? Well, Skype is obviously a very popular video conferencing system. A lot of teachers and students default to Skype because they already have it downloaded on their computers. But what we like about Zoom is that it performs extremely well, well in low bandwidth situations. So unlike Skype, if your, if your student or if yourself, yourselves are in a, an area with weak internet connection, Zoom actually performs really well. It knows to throttle 
your student off of the system. It knows to, to kick your student off and bring them back in um, when their internet speed is much greater. Zoom also has great screen sharing functionality and it has a lot of annotations built into the site. So by annotations, I mean drawing tools. Um, here is an example of a drawing tool on Zoom. We're going to get into much more of these later. But while you're, while you're screen sharing, you can, you can draw on the screen and really focus attention um, of your students on different parts of the content that you're teaching. And you can create recordings using Zoom, which is really great if you're teaching young learners and you want to keep a record of your lessons just in case the, the parents ever want to see a recording. But of course, even adult learners um, sometimes find it as a value add to get a recording of their class so that they can watch it um, between lessons. And the other nice thing is that joining a Zoom video conferencing classroom is really simple. You set up individual links for each student, and then you share the link with just that student. And then anytime they have a lesson with you, they click the link, and within two seconds, they're in, they're in the classroom. There's no need to, to have, the, have the student added as a contact, like on Skype, or to, to, call, to call the student. And the cost is not bad either. So as we all know, Skype is free. Um, Zoom, for one-on-one -on -one lessons, you, get, you can get a full, a full featured product for free. And then if you want to run group lessons, so that is more than two, more than one student at a time in one lesson, then you'll need a pro account, which is $10 a month. And now I'm going to pass it over to James. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Chris. Uh, I noticed there's a few things come through on the Q&A, so I'll leave you to uh, answer those to, to uh, the listeners as we're going along. So a very quick rundown about myself. Um, first of all, welcome. Uh, obviously, my name is James. I've been teaching online now exclusively for just over three and a half years. Um, so I've clocked up about four and a half thousand hours online, uh, almost exclusively with Zoom. So I know Chris has told you the, the positives of that and I tend to use it online uh, for the same reasons that he was talking about. Uh, I teach primarily young learners, <clears throat> excuse me, aged between about 10 and 14, but I do also teach uh, numerous adult students as well. So I'm going to run through uh, the things that you can actually see on the slide. I'll get straight into it. Um, and I think if you're going to teach online, one of the, the probably the most important thing that you need to find out from the student and then really take charge of is are you going to be teaching a curriculum or will you be offering supplementary practice? And it sounds like a very basic question, but I find that if teachers don't ask this question to the student and find out that information from the very beginning, your student is actually going to lose motivation and also you don't have somewhere to guide you. You don't have an idea of what to guide you over the, the, the medium to long term with the student. Uh, as most of us know with private tuition, we can kind of get our way through the first three, four, five lessons. But if you don't know whether it's A, your curriculum or B, you're just supplementing what the student is already doing, for example, at a language institute, you're going to find that you can't set goals and the student doesn't have anything to come back to to see the way in which they're improving. So it's a really important question, um, particularly if you're going to be teaching the curriculum. If you are going to teach a, a, a particular curriculum, you need to find out exactly what it is that the student's goals are. If the student is already attending an institute or attending any kind of schooling with, with language, you need to find out also what that is and how you are going to supplement that. Because if you are going to be doing supplementary lessons, the student will have very different expectations. They expect you to kind of bring them up to speed with what's happening in the class. And it will very much depend on what information is then available to them to give to you. Uh, also, if you are teaching young learners, you can be sh assured that parents will naturally expect you to understand the curriculum that is happening at the school. They may or may not be able to give you access to the school's 
online curriculum system. It may not even be available online, but you need to be very aware that if you go in to teach young learners in particular, that it's really important to have contact with the, the parents, uh, not, the, not the students, normal school teachers, uh, and find out exactly what's going on. So that, that's the first thing. Um, you can obviously teach speaking, reading, listening, and writing online, but the extent and the, the the extent to which you can teach them and the success that you will have with them will vary both on your ability as a teacher and the preferences uh, of the student. Speaking is the one that most people consider comes naturally to them online and obviously if it's online you are going to be doing a lot of speaking but be aware that you still need structure. A student will find speaking engaging and motivating but you need to be aware that you may not actually be accomplishing anything and if it just turns into an open-ended conversation with no structure whatsoever from your part you will find that motivation drops off because it then becomes why am I paying you to do this or I'm not really getting anything out of this so be very aware if you're just going to focus on speaking and I'll come to some of the uh, visual prompts that we use to keep students really focused and to give you some structure to the lesson. Reading is something that I've had a lot of success with online. It's probably been the thing that I least enjoyed teaching in a classroom environment, um, but I find that reading, obviously, and writing go hand in hand. Uh, and so I've, I'll go through reading activities. They can be done online, but the way you visually uh, present a reading activity is hugely important more so than a book where you can turn the pages it's really important when you do reading activities with students online that you and the students are looking at the same material at the same time and that you're not trying to find chapters and page numbers things like that so I'll give you some ideas around there listening is again is like speaking there's so much available already on YouTube that it's, um, you know, it can sometimes feel like I'll just go in and find a YouTube activity, but you need to be very aware that listening, if you, if you have an online activity and it's just YouTube, it becomes passive very quickly for the student and you're not engaged and the student becomes disengaged quite quickly. So before putting YouTube on, although it is probably the best resource for listening activities that's currently available on the web because of the breadth and the depth of what's, of what's there, just be very aware that you need to still prepare something before you share your screen and go into a passive listening activity. Writing actually is, well for me as a teacher, it's always been the most challenging one to teach. Not that I think I'm bad at teaching it, but students definitely don't write as much as well certainly as I did when I get to went to school but they certainly write in different ways and as teachers we need to acknowledge that and accept that it's not getting worse but it has become very different one of the things I really like about teaching online is using the chat function because it's a very sneaky way of getting students to respond to you by simply using as some of you have used the Q&A function now I simply do it with my students when I'm going along and get them to write. You can't get them to write a full essay in front of you and in fact there's not a huge amount of point in doing that but you can certainly teach writing skills um, and I'll, I'll go through a little bit of that when I show you off to class. One thing that teachers, okay, I'll, I'll mention obviously I'm in a very uh, barren landscape at the moment. It looks, you know, I could be anywhere and it's white, but I've chosen that because we're in a webinar. Uh, Chris, on the other hand, uh, if you can see his screen has got, you know, a lot of stuff around him, which is known uh, in teaching as you would probably all know realia. It's something that you should use heavily with students. Because most students will be in either a room in their house or somewhere in their office, if not at their desk, make use of everything that is there that students, especially when they can you know, get involved in something kinesthetically, they can pick it up, they can show it to you, and you can do likewise, the lesson immediately becomes interesting. So think outside the box when you're teaching verbs of action. There's nothing wrong with getting people to stand up, move around, act things out. And another way I do that is when I first started teaching online, I found that my face in front of the webcam was a little bit too much for students. 
And so I bought uh, a camera that allows me to position uh, the camera anywhere I want in the room, including allowing me to step back. I normally teach in a room that has a whiteboard and it brings them much more into a traditional classroom and often gives students the space that they need. It really depends on your personality uh, and and really the student's personality. Some people are very used, young students in particular, are very used to the webcam in this position here. But I found that when teaching adults, just giving them a little bit uh, of, of distance between myself and them uh, was, a, was a good thing to do. Um, personal, per, personalize, okay, I guess uh, any teaching book you've read in the last 20 years has, has always said personalize it for the student. Uh, I agree with that completely. I still see a lot of teachers uh, when I'm doing some training sessions with them who really don't understand that when you have a tool in front of you, you've got to adapt that tool or use that tool in a way that's correct for the student. You need to fit the tool to the student and not the other way around. So it does pay, although you may not want to ask really personal questions, anytime you have an open-ended or an image on uh, open-ended question or an image on the screen convert it into something that means something to the student and that's where you need to be very aware of their own proficiency in the, the sorry the student's proficiency in his or her own language a lot of teachers are very against using the student's language in class and if you know it Obviously, there are reasons to use it and not to use it, but at least be aware of where they are in their own education system. And that also comes into understanding the cultural concepts that goes with that student's culture, what is suitable and unsuitable for a teacher, and being very sensitive to those things uh, also. Um, keeping concepts relevant to the age group really ties in with what I said previously. And Obviously, if you are teaching anybody under 18, you need to be aware that they are very much still at a, de de sorry, I can't even say it. they're still developing through the education process. And the younger you get, the greater the development from year to year. So what you can teach and how you would teach to a five-year-old is almost completely different to what you will do with a 10-year-old, similar to a 12-year-old. And then after the age of 18, you can really go into sort of more adult type topics. But be very aware of what you're picking, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that it really needs to be to be relevant there. So I think we can go on to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the next slide, Chris. Excuse me one second. Okay, because you're teaching online, the content that you need has to be extremely visual. One of the things I noticed early on in my online teaching was that as much as I can be animated in a classroom, it's really important that the student has something else to focus on. They simply don't want to be looking at you the entire time, even if you're doing a speaking activity. And by having really strong, bright, consistent, professional looking visual content, you will find that the student is highly engaged in the lesson and it actually takes the pressure off of you. You want to be concentrating on the same thing that the student's concentrating on. And as a teacher, if you're continually thinking, what am I going to ask next? Instead of actually listening to what you've prompted the student to say, you're going to find, you know, it's a frustrating thing to teach online. Uh, and more so if you're doing group lessons. So I find that having visuals is the only way to retain students long term. Um, obviously, we live in an image-based society now anyway. Um, keep the amount of text that you have on, uh, on screen limited and just make sure that it's visually pleasing. Choose culturally negative uh, and when I say culturally negative, non-specific, I think is the word I want, uh, images as much as possible. All right, I think that's uh, that one done, Chris. So I think it's up to me to now go into our product. Um, we, teaching online, as I mentioned, one of the things I first noticed was the need for having really strong visual content. So we provide it for one-to-one -one, uh, teachers. Uh, we've got a lot of reading, speaking, vocabulary, and we've got other style uh, of lessons in there. We're now, I think, even higher than 330 lessons. The main thing that we do is we provide notes for every slide that you have in the class. 
depending on your experience as a teacher, you may or may not want to use those slides, but we've tried to leave the slides as adaptive as possible. We don't expect, when you get uh, start showing you the lessons, I don't expect any teacher to follow the slides you know, from A to Z, top to bottom, left to right. We expect you to be adaptive as you go along, and then it's really there as a crux for the lesson. It will give you more than the basics, and then you do with it as you will. Um, and they're perfect for screen sharing. So I'm going to um, I'm going to start screen sharing now, and go into the site itself. Uh, but before I do, thanks, Chris. Oh, it's all right. I'll go into that. <coughs> so here we have the main. Oh, excuse me. Okay. So here we have the uh, main screen, the home screen when you come in. When you log into the site, you come to, I guess, our, our contents page, if you like. I'll just let you know at the top of the screen uh, that we have a search function. It's not available to you yet. We're currently in the testing phase, but we're quite excited about that. Um, it's certainly going to make it easier to find lessons now that we're getting larger and larger in number. You will, however, see under here that we've got a series of levels. So if you want to do a really quick search, all you need to do is click on all levels. It will take everything back to zero. And then if you click on the lesson levels that you're looking for today, they will be highlighted again within the bands. As you come to next, you can see that we've got it divided into categories. Um, they're pretty standard as you would find in any uh, grammar book. So what you can do is under look see under each category, uh, for example, under phrasal verbs here. By the way, anything I'm drawing on screen is not part of off to class, but it comes automatically with Zoom, as Chris mentioned. So just keep that in mind. Uh, I find it highly valuable to focus students online. Uh, you have a drop down screen. So you can simply click on the drop down screen in the category of phrasal verbs and it will give you a list of everything that's available. I've just noticed as well that I need to go up and bring all the levels back in because we have far more phrasal verbs available than that. So the drop down list will give you the full range of the lessons that are available. And then under that you have another three. One is to launch the lesson. The second one, the magnifying glass, will give you a preview of the lesson. And the third icon will show you the homework that goes with that lesson. So first of all, I'll preview the lesson that I selected, which shows you primarily where it fits into the series and the objectives of the lesson. Now, I'm not going to teach from here, so I'll click on the left facing arrow to return to the home page. Before I teach, I'll just have a preview of the homework and I'll go through homework with you more. But before you teach, you might like to see what's coming up for the student in that lesson. And I'll just return here now. Finally, the rocket icon, self-explanatory, launches the lesson. So you'll see a prompt that comes up and who are you teaching today? I'm going to enroll a student and I'll take you to the student panel after. I'll enroll my test student and I can click on there and enroll that student. The reason you enroll a student electronically is the same as you would do in a classroom so that you have a record of having taught that student and also once you've enrolled the student you can then send the homework directly from the screen at the end. So when you come into our classroom, this is what the classroom looks like. On the left are the teacher's notes, and on the right is the screen that the student see and where you will do the majority of your teaching. In the top right-hand corner over here, you'll see a toggle switch. And when I click on that, what's going to happen is that the teacher notes will pop out and you should see only on the screen now a larger version of the electronic classroom. So the first page is always a title page. With the teacher notes, wanting to access them, you can just get them here from 
uh, logging into another device. You can log in from your smartphone or from a tablet. You go back into our site, log into our site, and then it will bring you to the notes that you are teaching for that lesson. Alternatively, if you want to keep them on the screen with you, all you need to do again is toggle. And then if you reduce your screen browser, so you reduce the actual size of the browser, that will allow you to see those on your screen with the classroom and the student will see only the notes. Lessons follow a similar structure, but not the same for each category. As we go through, we tend to have some kind of self-guided thing where you can really see if the student already has some idea. So you might want to give them something with a small amount of reading. Um, we'll start to introduce some vocabulary and almost all of our slides will have some images. As I said, images are often the best way to get to prompt a student to talk. Um, so we use them in about 90% of the slides. As you progress through the lesson, we'll do more self-discovery type activities, more warming up activities, and then you'll probably come to a summary eventually uh, and some more, uh, sorry, some less controlled activities. So I'll take you through a couple of those that I've opened up already. Here, we've got a very typical uh, summary uh, that we've got for conditionals and wishes. That's another category we have. And using the um, annotation tools, you can simply bring the student's um, focus to where you want it. You can ask them to read things. You could even ask them to put it into the, neg the, you know, the negative tense. As I said, try to be as adaptive as you can with the tool, even though you know, the screen themselves are static. Uh, once we've gone through some grammar summary and explained things, we'll start into a very basic activity. Here, we've got the standard gap fill. Uh, some teachers prefer not to use these, uh, and yet some teachers I've spoken with really love them uh, because again, you know, we give a, a, a demonstration at the top. It becomes fairly easy for students to do it. Um, but what you can then do is, you know, start using the annotations, it becomes very effective. You might decide, you know, ticks and crosses are in order. You might change the order and get them to do it back to front, which is always really important to move around the way you control the visual display with the student. Uh, and then once you've finished that activity, there's nothing that stops you from the teacher as getting them to, as I said, put it into the negative try another test, you know, here it's a lesson on the present perfect simple, you might want them to put it in the negative present perfect simple if you think it's time for that, or you might want them to then revert to a uh, past simple. So again, about adapting what we've shown to you. We have some good matching activities. I find this is great for introducing new vocabulary. Uh, this kind of thing. So again, drawing on the screen is really helpful. You can also pull out particular parts of those definitions, look at some of the more difficult words before you proceed, uh, draw on the screen whatever you feel is necessary uh, and that works for you. Students love to be able to do that. And I'll just mention that with Zoom, you can actually give the control of, the, of your screen to your student. So um, you give the remote control and they can actually then come in and draw on your student, sorry, draw on your screen and use the tools. Obviously, the younger the student, perhaps the more careful you need to be um, as long as you trust them. But be aware uh, that some people are a little bit slow uh, with these time, types of tools. My young learners I've taught for about two and a half years and I often give control of the screen to them now. Again, it just creates further engagement. So that was a matching activity. Uh, I'll go now and let you show you very briefly, we've got speaking activities also really heavy on images. Uh, but I find these particularly good for teachers who don't want, who want a less structured activity and to get the students talking. We'll always introduce a lot of images, get the student talking about, see what they already know. Then we provide vocabulary that they may or may not wish to use, but you can start to use the, that vocabulary in context. As we go through, we'll continue 
to introduce lots of bright pictures, more vocabulary, and the speaking activity will eventually come to a small reading text. This is really good for obviously highlighting uh, the different parts of the vocabulary that appear. You might even want to start highlighting structures and get them to repeat that for, for different parts of the vocabulary. And at the end, we will have this prompt. So hopefully, after going through the vocabulary, which I think you should take as slowly as possible, the reading text, which will put the vocabulary in context, finally we give these lesson prompts. And without further ado, I'm hoping that your students will be able to start using the vocabulary in an active sense. Um, but again, adapt it as much or as little as you need to. Speaking is something that I've had a lot of success with online. And so I have got a speaking activity opened up here. Where is it? Okay, so we've got a speaking activity here, sorry, a reading activity here, which we've had a lot of success with. Uh, we have graded the language for different levels. So if you use the level sorting system on the home page, it will actually show you which reading activities for which levels. Obviously go in and get familiar with these. Obviously we start with very bright images and some prompts to get the student to guess uh, predictive type activities with lots of questions, more images, and then we will come into the text. On the left hand side, you'll see quite clearly, you may or may not wish to go through uh, the vocabulary before. Um, it is also highlighted in the text. Uh, with, we've got the subscripts um, that highlight the vocabulary as you go through. It's up to you how you want to do that. Then at the end of the text, we will have some concept check questions. What, what can they remember? Some gap fill activities and a general discussion question or a couple at the end. One thing that we've had a lot of success with is that a lot of online teachers struggle with reading but we have created uh, some activities for the students, their homework activities or post-lesson activities that the student can do online. And the really good thing about it is it actually takes the same text. So I'm now in the homework screen for the reading activity of Valentine's Day. You would assign this at the end of class. The student will log in, and I'll show you the student panel in a moment, and they will actually see the same text, but with questions that require a much deeper reading. So we have included the text. It's here for them. It usually just has one image now. We've got the paragraphs numbered for easy reference. And then if they go back into the text, you'll see, for example, we've got the very standard multiple choice, but they, they're not easy, not even at the, uh, they really do require the student to go in and, and have a good look through the text. Uh, so we'll, again, some images here. Once you've gone through multiple choice, we will come to some harder activities or more challenging activities where you need to actually see if the language below is actually that statements providing whether they're true or false uh, by the author in the text. Sometimes we ask them to put statements in order from which the first, sorry, from uh, the order in which the author uh, delivers those in the text, or they might be asked to order the facts historically. Then we've got some actual matching activities that come directly from the sentences in the text itself. And then in each reading activity, we'll reuse the vocabulary in other contexts. So again, another gap fill, and the students simply just need to click on that. Anywhere they need to fill in, they just click on with their mouse and they can type the answer in here. And then down the bottom, we'll have some open-ended questions. Uh, it's up to you how you want to do that. I'll just let you know that when the student logs in, they will actually come to a slightly different page. Uh, you can go into our home page and uh, you'll see about a, we have a, a video about assigning and managing homework. So what I'll do now is I'll actually go into that panel. 
And you can see here when you close the classroom in a lesson, it will prompt you. The system will actually prompt you and ask you whether you want to send the homework now. You also, it will also ask you whether you want to add a due date. I keep mine defaulted at no due date, but you can change that in your, in your management panel. Now, I have actually sent this homework previously to a student. It's asking me if I want to send it again. That's happening because it's a test, a test student that I use for these demonstrations, but I will override that and I will send that now. So that homework will come through for the student. As the teacher, I'm going to come back and assume that the student has logged in at a time convenient for them. They've opened up the homework and they've completed that online. I've then logged in again as the teacher because I will have received an email from the system saying student X has completed homework Y. I'll come back into my student panel. I'll go into that student's account. You can see here a lesson history of all the lessons that I have taught with that student and that is only activated if you have enrolled the students in the lessons. We also have a note-taking system. I'll go back and show that to you. Uh, if you take notes, they will always appear. Uh, I've made a couple of notes of things that had come up in lessons when I was teaching phrasal verbs, and so there's a note here for me to teach this student about causative verbs and uh, someone, anyone, uh, no one in, a, in an upcoming lesson. I find that it's a good thing to take the notes as you go through the lessons because as teachers we tend to have good memories but we also are controlling a large flow of information so I put the note taking in there. Homework assignments, you can see that the student's quite good, she does all of the homework I send her and what I'm going to do now is have a look at something that she has completed. So I can come across here I'll click on completed and immediately it brings up the answer key that we provide and the student answers. So the first thing I want to say is on the right hand side, any answer that differs from the answer key is automatically placed into an orange font. This doesn't necessarily mean that the answer is wrong, it means that it's different. And because it's the English language, in all cases, it's very possible that there are two or more answers. If the student has followed the instruction to the letter, usually there's one answer, but the nature of language is that the more advanced the level, the greater the chance that the student can put in an alternative answer. So here, I'll just highlight, for example, that the student has given me a different answer in section A, question two. However, I would have no problem with that. It's still a correct answer. They've just changed the pronoun. And so what I would do then is take the tick and put that across there and the tick will come up. It's up to you how you want to mark it, but I find that teachers are really enjoying these little things. It's actually even a good, uh, a good, a good, um, practice for teachers to actually go through and mark the homework. Uh, we also have something here, which the little notepad icon, you can drag that across and I will actually put in here, this is a great alternative answer. So you add that in as a note, click on save, and when the student comes back, she will actually be able to click and see the, uh, sorry, put her uh, cursor over it and see it. So you can go through and mark it, see where they're going well, and at the bottom of the homework screens, you will actually see, I'll go back to the previous one, if you want to leave a general comment for the homework, again, you can go in and give an overall comment as, as you like. So we're just adding extra functionality in there for you to engage the students and make sure that they know that you've actually taken the time to look at the homework. Once you, oh sorry, I didn't mention, the student also has a summary here. Once you've taught the lesson, 
we will give access to the student to go back and see the basic grammar that was shown in that slide and they can refer to that as they go through the homework. Most students really enjoy seeing this and in fact we put this in after getting a lot of feedback from teachers and students so we know that this is something that is being heavily used now. I didn't mention that the student will always have, when they are actually filling out the homework, they will actually have two buttons that you can't see at the moment on the screen. At the bottom, there will be two buttons here. On the left, sorry, on the right, they will have a save and continue button. And on the left will be a button that says submit. Obviously, once they submit the homework, it's no longer available for them to uh, amend and that homework will come through to you and you will receive a notification from us. Okay, that's the homework. And I think, Chris, have I missed anything out? I think I'm probably... No, nope, sounds I... good. So we can go to um, some questions. 